Hello, everyone, and welcome to this LSAT Basics webinar. I hope you can hear me. If you cannot, please let me know. I see a bunch of stuff popping up into the chat. There's a lot of you, um, so I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to follow the chat. But here is how today is going to work. So we're going to talk through the LSAT a little bit. Um, in addition to that chat box, you're also going to see a Q&A box. If you would like, you can um, put questions in there, and I'm going to answer as many questions as I can at the end of this session. Um, I believe you can also raise your hand, and I can answer questions as you raise your hand. So if you would like to ask a question during um, this session, feel free to raise your hand, and I will call on you. And it should, I believe, unmute you and allow you to ask a question. Um, there's a lot of participants in the chat, so. Hopefully it won't get too crowded, but that's the basic idea. Um, all right, I hear we can hear you, fantastic. So let me just uh, get a few things out of the way before we start talking about the LSAT. Um, I put at the top of the chat box um, something that we're very, very proud of. We actually have a new podcast here at LSAT Max. It's called The Legal Level. I'm plugging it not only because I'm part of LSAT Max, but because I am one of the co-hosts, along with Yellen Awar, who is very brilliant. And um, it is a podcast that focuses on law in general, um, but it focuses most specifically on how it applies to people who are currently in the process of studying for the LSAT, who are in law school, who are studying for the bar exam. Um, so I've put in the links for the Apple podcast version and the Spotify version. So please click on those, subscribe, rate us five stars, um, I hope you like it. Um, let's see. Oh, and a few announcements before we get started. I think these are things that might be useful to you. Today is the last day to move um, your March LSAT, which was canceled, to the April LSAT for free. So you might want to do that as soon as you get out of here if that's something that you need to do. You also can, because of this whole new world that we live in, LSAC has made it so that if you took an LSAT previously and you canceled your score, you can now go back, have a look at your score and decide whether or not it's a score that you would like to keep and send on to law schools. Um, so that can be very helpful. So think about that if you have a canceled score. So I see uh, a couple of questions going into the Q&A, fantastic. We will answer those soon. Um, there should also be in the chat box, and I don't know if I'm seeing it here, a link to, uh, oh, I see links, here we go. Uh, oh, and at the bottom is a link to the PDF that I'm going to work through. So if you guys don't have that now, it's just been shared from TestMax to all panelists. Um, please download that and you're gonna follow me through it. So I'm gonna share my version with you on the screen, but it will be helpful for you to have your version. Alrighty. What I have to do to get this session going is to share my screen with you. And I'm going to do that right now, hopefully. Um, let's see, where is it? That should hopefully do it. Open. Looks like it's all working, which is good. Share content. And it should all come up. There it is. Hopefully, you guys can see my screen. So I'm going to pull open uh, a copy of this presentation. So here's the way this presentation is going to work, is that I'm going to give you some information, some basic information about the LSAT, what it is, what it tests, how you get your score, what constitutes a good score. Um, and then I'll talk to you a little bit later about how LSAT Max approaches the LSAT, how we can help you get the score that's going to get you into your dream school. And then, like I said, there should be a Q&A after, and I'm happy to answer the questions that you guys have then. So following along, open up your PDF booklets. On the first page of this presentation, it says LSAT, Law School Admission Test. So the LSAT stands for Law School Admission Test. It is, since last year, an electronic test. Um, you take it on a tablet, you get a stylus, you get some scratch paper, 
Up until then, it was a paper exam, but now it's an electronic exam. There are thir six 35-minute sections on the exam. Only four of those six sections will actually count toward your score. There are about 100 scored questions. And your scaled score, the score that law schools will see and the one that you will either be proud of or less proud of, is scored on a scale of 120 to 180. Um, like I said, it's six 35-minute sections. And there are a couple of different section types. So you'll see in the middle here in this scored area where it says logical reasoning, two out of the four scored sections. Um, I hear we can't hear you. Is it just Erica who can't hear me or nobody can hear me? Okay. Um, okay, good, good, good. All right, so let's continue on. So logical reasoning is about half of your scaled score. There are two sections, two scored sections. And what a logical reasoning section does is they'll give you between 24 and 26 questions. Each one follows uh, a little paragraph. Usually there is an argument in the paragraph and they will ask you a multiple choice question about that argument. They'll ask you something like, uh, what's wrong with the argument? Or what is the argument's conclusion? Or how could you make this argument better? Or how could you make this argument worse? That's about half of your scaled score. There are two other sections, and you'll get one sc uh, scored section each of those. The one that looks most familiar to students is reading comprehension. In a reading comprehension section, you get four passages to read, and somewhere between 26 and 28 questions in each one of those passages. And this tends to be the section that students, I would say, focus the least on, because it seems most like what they've done. Most people who go to law school, just like me, are humanities majors, and you spent four years reading and hopefully comprehending what you're reading. And so you say, well, look, I've got this. I don't have to study this this much. Well, I think it's a little bit um, misleading when they call it reading comprehension because you're being asked to do more than just comprehend. Instead, what you're being asked to do really is, or what they're testing you on anyway, is your ability to read a judicial opinion, which is going to be most of your reading in law school. In a judicial opinion, a judge, or more likely the judge's clerk, will write out the arguments of plaintiff and defendant, and will usually decide which one between the two of them is correct and decide for them. And so what you're doing, the most important thing you're doing in reading comprehension is not just comprehending, but tracking the arguments that are made. Even in passages, they have passages that are biographical passages or science passages that seem like they have nothing to do with the practice of law. But the process you are engaging in tracking those arguments is the same. That's a very long way of saying that you shouldn't give this one short shrift as you're studying for the LSAT. It is very important and it's different than what you've done. The final scored section of the LSAT is the one that just freaks most students out, and it's called logic games. In logic games, they will give you four setups, and between 22 and 24 questions, usually about five to seven questions per setup. And when I say setup, what I mean is they'll give you a situation, they'll give you some rules that govern that situation, and then they ask you to apply those rules to figure out how the situation plays out. Very commonly, it'll be like seven runners are finishing a race, and they will give you rules about how they finish. Runner A finishes after runner C. Runner D can't finish third, fourth, or fifth. Things like that. And then they will ask you, once you have all those facts down, which one of the following must be true about this game? What has to happen? Or what can't happen with this game? Things like that. People hate it because it's weird. Um, it's very strange, and it looks like nothing they have ever done before. Luckily, it is the most learnable section of the exam, so students who struggle with it, um, if you're willing to put in the effort and to really learn the different ways that the makers of the LSAT do the same thing over and over again, that's true of logic games, it's true of the other sections of the exam, it is learnable and it's kind of like math. It is not, people hate it because they think it has nothing to do with the practice of law. Well, it's testing your ability to apply rules to a situation which is a lot of what lawyers do. So it, it is relevant as much as it may not be fun for some people. I happen to like logic games. I'm a weirdo. Those are the four sections that constitute the entirety of this score, 120 to 180. Those four sections, depending upon how you do on those, will tell you what your score is. 
you'll notice that there are two other sections that are not scored. First, let's talk about this guy, the writing sample. Ever since this became an electronic exam, the writing sample is now a take-home exam. Um, you can do it, I think, within a year of having taken your LSAT. It does not enter into your score. What you're being asked to do is to write an essay much like most of your finals in law school. In law school, almost all of your finals are essay finals. And so they're testing your ability, even though the LSAT is a multiple choice exam, they're just testing your ability to write an argumentative essay, which is what you will be doing in law school. It's important that you try hard, um, but this does not enter into your score. It's not graded by anybody. Instead, whatever you write is sent along to the schools that you apply to without comment. And so those schools can do whatever they want with it. Finally, the last section, the other unscored section, is what we call the experimental section. And what the experimental section is, is on one of the most stressful days of your life, the makers of the LSAT are making you pay good money to be a guinea pig for them. In the experimental section, they are testing out questions that will be used on a future exam, but no matter what you answer, it does not count toward your score. So you could, in theory, take a nap during that section and your score would not change. The problem is, during that time, you will not know that you are doing the experimental section. It will look like just an extra one of these. So for instance, if ultimately on test day you have two reading comp sections, that means one of them was the experimental because there's always only one scored reading comp section. So that's the structure of the exam. Now let's talk about, oh, and I already wrote all over this. I was supposed to wait for you. Let's talk about what the LSAT actually tests. So people look at it and they say, oh, well, it's the SAT with the word law in front of it, so it must just be the SAT. Well, it's actually absolutely nothing like the SAT. Instead, and it's nothing like any other standardized exam you've ever taken before, the LSAT tests these skills pretty much exclusively. Logic, which is about one third of the exam, an argument analysis and evaluation, and I'll explain what I mean by those in a second, is about the other two thirds of the exam. So logical reasoning tests both of these. Logic games is all about logic. Reading comprehension is only about argument analysis and evaluation. But the way it works out is that most of it is about argument analysis and evaluation. So we're actually going to do logic in a couple of different ways a little bit later in this presentation. So I'm not going to um, talk too much about logic right at this moment, other than to say the definition of logic, what is logic? It's just putting together a couple of facts and coming up with a third fact. Probably the most familiar logic to you would be math. If I told you I had three apples, I went to the store and I bought two more apples, from that you could conclude that I have five apples. And that's logic. It's numeric logic. On the LSAT, the logic will be different. Um, but that's the basic idea. This other part, argument analysis and evaluation, it makes a lot of sense that that's what they're testing because as a lawyer, that's a lot of what you do. You make arguments. You want to attack your opponent's arguments. You want to make sure your arguments are sound and logical. You want to find the vulnerabilities in your opponent's argument. You even want to find the vulnerabilities in your own argument because it's important for you to go to court, not blindsided by the attacks that your opponent is going to make. So let me just um, let me just give you an example, and I'll use that example to work through what I mean by the ideas of argument analysis and evaluation because there are two different things. So let's say I'm a prosecutor, and my argument, the thing that I'm trying to prove, um, always boils down to about the same thing. So an argument really has just about two pieces to it. An argument is a conclusion. That's the most important part of an argument, something that an author is trying to prove to you. And then at least one premise, which is support for that conclusion. So let me give you this argument. Let's say, Johnson was found stabbed in his hotel room.
I went to law school because I watched too much Law and Order. I'm guessing that's the same for you. So that's where this example comes from. Only the maid had the key. Therefore, the maid is guilty. So argument analysis, a lot of times they'll just ask you to describe what it is you're saying. They will give you, if this was in a, a stimulus in a logical reasoning question, they would just give you these three statements in some order and you would have to pick out how they interact with one another. And so you don't necessarily know what are the pieces of the argument, which is the conclusion, which is the premise. They just give you the sentences, but then they might ask you just straight up, what is the conclusion of the argument? That is actually a common question type on the LSAT. Um, and here, the conclusion is that the maid is guilty. That's what the author is trying to prove to you. These other two things, the idea that Johnson was found stabbed in his hotel room, only the maid had a key, those are supposed to be reasons, premises supporting the idea that the maid is guilty. So that's argument analysis, just being able to identify what it is you're seeing in terms of argument structure. Argument evaluation is arguably a more important skill and is tested very, very regularly. And when I say evaluation, what I'm saying is we have to determine with each argument, is it good or bad? And if so, how? How is it good? How is it bad? And so this argument, if you were a juror, and this is everything that the prosecutor presented to you, Johnson was found stabbed in his hotel room, only the maid had the key, therefore the maid is guilty. I hope you would say, that's a terrible argument, and I'm not going to convict the maid just on this flimsy evidence. So when I'm thinking about argument evaluation, that's what I'm thinking, this is a bad argument. This is a very strong conclusion. We're trying to show that the maid must have done it, but we're doing a very bad job of supporting it. Um, and so here's how I think it's bad, and here's how evaluation is tested on the LSAT. Well, what this argument is trying to do and is failing to do miserably is to exclude everyone else. It's trying to rule out other suspects. That's, I think, the implication behind the idea only the maid has a key, but that doesn't rule out other suspects. Um, not if there's you know, a window in this hotel room, or maybe the door was open, or maybe Johnson had somebody staying in his, his hotel room with him, or maybe Johnson stabbed himself. None of this supports that very strong conclusion um, that the maid is guilty because it's trying to eliminate other suspects and it's doing a bad job of it. So when I say argument evalua evaluation, that's what I mean. I think that idea of evaluation is one of the hardest shifts for students to make from studying for whatever it is they study as undergrads to studying for the LSAT. Because when you're given reading to do as an undergrad, you're supposed to learn from it and possibly be critical of it, but mostly to understand what you're reading and to be able to relate what you have learned from it. On the LSAT, they serve you garbage and they ask you to understand why is it garbage? How is it bad? And so instead of being receptive to the arguments that you're hearing, you have to be critical of them, which is very, very different. All right, so that is what the LSAT tests. And again, it's a test of logic and argumentation. It is something that is very, very different than what most students have gone through. So for most students, you've got to give yourself a lot of time to prepare for the exam. Um, let's talk about how you get that score. Like I was talking about, the score on the LSAT is 120 to 180. 120 sounds pretty good, but 120 is not good, obviously, because it, because it is the lowest score. But how do you get this score? What does it mean to get a 120? Obviously, you're not answering 120 questions correctly just to get the lowest score, especially since there are only 100 scored questions. Um, so let's first talk about how you get this score. So if you look at this page right here where it says, what is a good score? If you see this information right here, June 14 to February 17, the LSAT is a, uh, your score is a percentile based score by which I mean the way that you get your score on the LSAT is it is determined by the percentage of other test takers that you do better than. The percentage of other test takers that you answer more questions correctly than. 
And what this chart here is showing is the way the percentages play out and the way they did over this three year period. And so let me just point out what these different fields mean. This field on the left is scaled score. Like I said, 180 is the best score, 120 is the worst score. In the next column, that's over this period, over this three year period, how many test takers in total got that score? What you'll notice is for a 180, over three years, 85 people in the entire world got that score. It is very hard to get that score. Over that time, 880 people got a 120, which compared to the numbers in the middle is still actually not that many. Um, and then this final field is the percentile associated with that score. In other words, over this time period, for you to get that score, this is the percentage of other test takers that you would have had to beat out. What you'll notice is that at the top end and the bottom end, and it's a little easier to see, we've got it digested into um, a, a bell curve down here. This is this information represented along a curve. And what it shows is for the most part, when it comes to the really low scores, not a lot of people get those. When it comes to the really high scores, not a lot of people get those. And instead, most of us are in the vast middle here. Um, I would argue, and I hope that it would make sense, that 120 is a bad score that you should not submit to anybody, and 180 is a great score. But what is a good score? Because there's a lot of room between 120 and 180. And um, the discussion we're about to have right now should be something that you personalize for yourself. So when I say what is a good score, what I mean is, what is the score that's going to make you competitive at the school you want to go to? Um, so 180 is a good score, but what about 140, 150, 160? Well, here's how I think you can best serve yourself in figuring out what is the score that you need. Like I said, the score that you need is the score that's going to make you competitive at the law school that you want to go to. So what I would strongly recommend that you do is um, take a look at the schools that you're interested in and figure out what is their median LSAT. This is information that they have to publish every year. They send it out to the American Bar Association. And um, the median score is the score that at that school, half of people who entered that school got that score or above, and half of people got that score or below. In other words, if you get that score, the median score, and you go to that school, you'll be right smack dab in the middle of the other students there. And median obviously is different from school to school. So even though the US News and World Report rankings are not important and you should ignore them, I know many of you will not ignore them or you will be interested in other rankings. Um, but let's talk about a few different schools so we can kind of get a grasp on what a good score is. Because like I said, it's the score for you. So there is always every year a school that is um, rated number one in the US News and World Report rankings. Usually I ask people to chime in if they know what that is. With this many participants, that's gonna be a lot of people chiming in. But the school that is always number one, and I see it, Darren got uh, the jump on it. I see Jeremy, Yale. Yale is always number one. So if you want to get into Yale, you should be shooting for, depending upon what your GPA is, and if you want to go to Yale, your GPA ought to be pretty high. You need to shoot for their median score. So the median score at Yale is, oops. Let's go here. I know I can do this. Here we go. The median score at Yale is a 173. If you look over here, 173 corresponds to 99.1 percentile. What that means is that to be average at Yale, to be right in the middle, you must be in the top 1% of test takers in the country. You must beat out 99% of other test takers just to be average. Um, so 
I have a couple of other examples here just so we can get kind of a good idea. So Yale is at the top of the class. Um, other schools, I looked up Penn recently, which is always very highly ranked. That was a 170. Um, my school, the school that I went to, UCLA, the median there is a 166. I don't know what they're doing over there, but they're doing something right. Fordham somehow jumped 12 spots in the rankings from last year. I think that's in New York. They're 163. Um, to kind of get just a survey of the schools, I think I saw somebody talking about Pepperdine. Pepperdine is near me. Pepperdine, I think, is usually about a 160 is their median. Then you've got schools like Pitt. I think their median is a 156. Then in my neighborhood, I hope you guys can see this stuff. Sometimes when I have stuff on the right side of my screen, it's hard to see. Um, in my corner in Los Angeles, there's a school that's still ABA accredited, but easier to get into than other schools. It's Southwestern. Their median is a 152. So this is, uh, I think, kind of a good um, array of schools to talk about. The stuff at the very top is reach schools for almost everybody. The stuff at the bottom is the stuff that, depending upon um, how you've done in school and how you do on your LSAT, should be fairly straightforward to get into. What I hope you'll notice is that there is nothing on this list that is below 150. And so when you're talking about what is a good score, I think that changes from person to person. But I think anything to the left of 150 is a bad score because it's not even going to make you competitive at the schools that are not competitive. So long story short, figure out what is the score for you, but probably no matter what, if you wanna to go to law school, you need to shoot to get above a 150 on the exam. Now, that's not necessarily that hard because if you look, so to get into Southwestern, a 152, you have to beat out about half of the um, other test takers. So if you're average in the real world, then you can be average at Southwestern also. Um, one last thing when we're talking about score is, okay, it is a percentile score, but obviously you don't just get a percentile, you answer questions correctly, which is turned into a percentile. So how do you go from the number of questions that you answered correctly to the score that you get, your percentile? Well, there's a conversion chart. It's different for each exam, but they're actually pretty close from exam to exam. And so most of them follow um, this right here. So let's just think about this. Obviously a 180 is great, but look, you can miss a question or two and still get a 180. With a 170, this is going to very likely get you into a pen. It will make you competitive at a place like Yale or Stanford or Harvard. Um, out of about 101 questions, if you've got 89 out of 101 in one of your classes, what would you have? I'd call that maybe a B plus. That gets you competitive at Yale. Um, for a school like Fordham, a 160, is very likely to get you in. A 75 out of 101, that's about a C. Now, I don't want to attack Southwestern any more than I already have, but a score like a 150 might get you into a Southwestern. And if you'll notice, that's 57 questions correct out of about 101. That is, like I said, um, I want to be nice about it. Maybe I'll call it an F plus, but that's an F. That is missing almost half of the questions on the exam. Point being, this exam is hard. It is a difficult exam. Any reasonable program that's going to take you through the LSAT, however, is going to teach you how to maximize these numbers. Obviously, it's going to teach you to do that by teaching you how to answer questions correctly. But it's also a lot about test mechanics. And we focus on test mechanics as well at LSAT Max. Um, and so 
what we want to do is to pull as many points out of the exam as possible to get you your score, and that's what we focus on. All right, so that is all the kind of structural stuff. What it tests, how you get your score. For the next half hour, what I'd like to do is um, we're going to learn a little bit about logic. We're going to talk about it in terms of logical reasoning right now. You guys will get a chance to do a question on your own when we do that. And then we will do a logic game after that. Um, so these are of the four scored sections. Remember, there's two logical reasoning sections. There's one game section. So we'll see stuff from about three quarters of the exam. So like I was saying, um, the LSAT tests logic. So we talked about numerical logic, adding things together, but there are different forms of logic. And one of the most common forms of logic on the LSAT is symbolic logic. There are conditional statements. Those are if-then statements. Those are rules. And in law school, they'll talk to you about them as rules. Well, you need to, to succeed on the LSAT. You need to be able to diagram and combine statements that are conditional statements in order to come to conclusions. So let me give you a brief example. I'm gonna spend about the next four or five minutes teaching you everything you would need to know to address this first logical reasoning question. Then I'm gonna turn you guys loose and allow you to um, do this logical reasoning question yourself. So let's say I told you this. If you go to law school, you must have a bachelor's degree. This is a true statement. It's a conditional statement. It starts with the word if, and we're not talking about any particular law school. We're not talking about any particular person. Instead, we've got a rule of general applicability that tells us what is needed to get into law school. And like I said, this is a true statement. Anytime you have one of these statements, you can diagram it. You just make a little arrow. All the stuff that comes after if goes on the left side of the arrow, you should make an abbreviation, and then the other stuff goes on the right. So I would diagram that like this. If you are in law school, then you must have a bachelor's degree. A conditional statement always says more than it seems. Or the LSAT way of saying this is there are inferences that you can make given these conditional statements. And let's explore this a little. So some people think, well, I can probably just flop these things around, right? If you have a bachelor's degree, then you must go to law school. Like we said, this first statement is a true statement. So any inference that we can make from it should also be true, but this is not a true statement. I know maybe your parents told you if you have a bachelor's degree, then it is time to go to law school. But that is not a rule about how the world works. Plenty of people have a bachelor's degree, they go to med school, they go to grad school, they backpack through Europe, all sorts of things. So you can't just flop these things around. That's bad reasoning. Another type of bad reasoning is this. People say, well, I can just zero this out. I can just negate the terms. That first statement is true. If you go to law school, you must have a bachelor's degree. So I could just say, hey, if you don't go to law school, then you don't have a bachelor's degree. But again, this is not true. Plenty of people don't go to law school. Again, they go to grad school, they go to med school, they don't go on, and they still have a bachelor's degree. So this is also bad reasoning. However, if you do both of those operations, you reverse and negate, this is what you get. If you do not have a bachelor's degree, then you cannot go to law school. And that is a true statement, and it's a statement that can be derived from that initial statement. What that initial statement is saying is that a bachelor's degree is necessary to going to law school. So if I take away that thing that is necessary, the bachelor's degree, take it away, then I'm also taking away the thing to which it is necessary. This is what's known in the world of symbolic logic as the contrapositive, and this is valid reasoning. Anytime you have taken a statement as true, you have taken its contrapositive to also be true. So let's get these other guys out of the way. They are bad. Anytime you have a statement, you can reverse and negate all of the terms, and that statement is also true. I need to teach you guys one more thing and then I'm going to turn you loose on this question for probably about a minute or a minute and a half, which is when you have two conditional statements with shared terms, 
you can combine them. And when I was talking about doing logic, about how you're combining different ideas and coming up with a third idea, here's what I mean. So imagine I added to this, if you have a bachelor's degree, you are deeply in debt. Again, this is a conditional statement. It starts with the word if, so you could diagram that and it would look like this. If you have a bachelor's degree, then you are deeply in debt. When and only when we have this situation where the same term appears on the right side of the arrow in one statement, and on the left side of the arrow in another statement, you can combine and collapse them. Well, I know if you go to law school, you must have a bachelor's degree. And if you have a bachelor's degree, then you are deeply in debt. We can combine those to determine if you go to law school, then you are deeply in debt. We combine them and just collapse that shared term. It is also the case, since we have determined that this statement is true, that it's contrapositive would also be true reverse and negate all terms. If you are not deeply in debt, then you are not in law school. So to recap, we're about to do a question, which is a common question type on the LSAT called must be true questions. And often they'll give you a couple of statements and they'll say, assume those statements are true, which one of the following must be true. If they gave us these two statements in the stimulus, if you go to law school, you must have a bachelor's degree. And if you have a bachelor's degree, you are deeply in debt. The right answer choice would look like one of these two things. The conclusion that we came to, if you go to law school, then you're deeply in debt, or it's contrapositive. That must be the correct answer, and anything else will be the wrong answer. So having learned that, uh, diagramming a statement and taking its contrapositive, combining statements in the what we call the transitive, you now have what it takes to answer this question. So I'm gonna give you guys about 90 seconds Go ahead and try this question here, and then we'll come back and talk about it. All right, so that's probably enough time. I see a couple of answers already. So here is how I diagram these. There are two conditional statements. If you have no keyboarding skills, you will not be able to use a computer. So I diagram that like this. If not KS, then not C. And if you are not able to use a computer, you will not be able to write your essays using a word processing program. If not C, then not WP. We have our magic formula, a shared term that appears on the right side of the arrow in one statement and on the left in the other. We can combine those and it would look like this. If you don't have keyboarding skills, then you cannot use a word processor. The right answer choice will either look like that or it's contrapositive. Since these terms are already negated, to take the contrapositive would be to remove the negation, which would look like this. If you want to write your essays using a word processor, you must have keyboarding skills. That's why, and I see a couple of correct answers. The correct answer is C, and it's diagrammed just the same way as this contrapositive statement. If you are able to write your essays using a word processor, you have at least some keyboarding skills. The most popular wrong answer is A, and the problem is that it's um, reversed, or, or given the initial conclusion we came to, it's not negated. It looks like this. If you have keyboarding skills, 
Then you can use a word processor that looks like this. But it's wrong because it doesn't look like this guy. It's negated without being reversed. And it doesn't look like this guy. It's reversed without being negated. And so that's actually a logical fallacy. C is the correct answer. So far, so good. All right. Um, so we've got another, uh, another logical reasoning question. This question, uh, we still have to talk about logic games and we don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm going to skip this question right now. But I would recommend that you guys come back and take a look at this question because it is the most common question type on the exam. It's asking you what is wrong with the argument. Remember when I was talking to you about argument evaluation? That is hugely, hugely important, argument evaluation. Um, and that's what you're being asked to do here. They're telling you this is a bad argument. You must figure out how it is bad. We actually just recently added in the LSAT Max course um, a unit on common fallacies. The fallacy committed here is one of those common fallacies. And so memorizing those things is very helpful um, in seeing them. But like I said, you're being asked to evaluate this argument to figure out how it's bad. So give that one a crack on your own. All right, um, logic games. So we probably won't get through all of the questions with this logic game. But um, this is a real logic game from a recent exam. I want to say it was September 2018, something like that. And just like I taught you a couple of skills that were critical to answering that last logical reasoning question, I'm going to do my best to teach you a couple of skills that will make this game, which if you don't have these skills, I think is basically impossible, which will crack it open. Um, and so like I said, this is from a real exam. So you're about to get, if you have not taken the LSAT, you're about to get a taste of what it's like. So prepare yourself. So here's what this says. For an antiques fair at the local civic center, the fair's manager must assign each of six employees, let's just call them F, G, H, K, L, and M, to one of three information booths, the organizer's booth, the retailer's booth, and the visitor's booth. Each booth must be assigned at least one employee. The assignments are constrained as follows. The retailer's booth must have more employees than the visitor's booth. Neither F nor K can be assigned to the visitor's booth. Neither G nor H can be assigned to the organizer's booth. G and M must work at the same booth as each other. Um, most games on the LSAT ask you to do one or both of just two different things, putting things into order or into a sequence. That's not what this game is doing. This is a group game. And we have six people, and we are being asked to divide them up into three groups. Well, what is very mean about this game is that we don't even know how many people are in each group. And so let me show you what you want to do with every logic game, no matter what, is that they give you information to manage. You get some variables. Those are our um, employees, F, G, H, K, L, M. And your task and what students, I think, struggle with the most is to create a setup where you can display those variables in a way that is useful to you and in a way that won't lead you to make any mistakes. And so let me show you what I mean by that. Our variables, the guys that we have to keep track of are these guys, F, G, H, K, L, M. We must distribute them among three booths, the organizer's booth, the retailer's booth, and the visitor's booth. They give us a couple of what we call principles of distribution at least one employee is at each booth. The retailer's booth has more employees than the visitor's booth. And they're giving us hints about how we distribute variables to these groups. Well, if each booth has at least one employee, then I can at the very least put in a slot in each. Since there are six variables, that means there are three slots left and I'm not really sure where they go. And that right now, before we get to the questions, is a huge problem. Not only do we not know where all these variables go, we don't even know where we could place all of them. But they give us some information that's going to be very useful for us. Like I said, those principles of distribution, at least, more than. Um, before we talk about those, let's just run through the rest of these rules and make sure we have our rules represented. So the first rule says neither, neither F nor K can be assigned to the visitor's booth. I would just do this. F and K are not going in the visitor's booth. Neither G nor H can be assigned to the organizer's booth. I would just do that up here. No G, no H. 
Um, and finally, our last rule is, well, let me write down this first one. The retailer's booth must have more employees than the visitor's booth. I would just write that like this. R is going to be bigger than V, no matter how big each one is. And then that last rule I would write like this. G and M are always in the same booth together. Wherever I put one, the other one goes. When you get this far, we've created our setup. We've symbolized our rules. I think it's a little bit helpful, but if you look at the questions, we are not ready for the questions yet. So they'll give you something like, uh, I don't know, if neither Frank nor Keisha is assigned to the organizer's booth, which one of the following is a complete and accurate list of the booths to which Laura could be assigned? Oh my God, how are we gonna answer that? Well, we're not going to answer it with the information we have yet because we don't have enough information. But they've given us hints, they've given us stuff to work with, and it's those numbers. So first of all, let's just quickly do what we call deductions. Um, anytime you have a variable that shows up in multiple rules, you can usually make a deduction. Well, G shows up in two rules. We know G is never in the O booth and G is always with M. Putting those two things together, we can make the small, although useful deduction, that M is also not going in the organizer's booth. If M and G are always together, and G is not in the organizer's booth, M is not either. The only other deduction that I think you can make is if there are more in the R booth than in the V booth, and if we know the V booth has at least one, then the R booth is gonna have to have at least two. Otherwise, the R booth would not have more than the V booth. But again, there's still two more slots left to distribute, and we're not entirely sure where they go. But what we're going to do is what's called numerical distributions, and we're going to give ourselves an understanding of the different ways those slots can be distributed. And once we take the time to do that, we're gonna find it's going to blow this game open for us. So here's what I mean by numerical distributions. No, no matter what, if we dis distribute all our variables and we're supposed to distribute all our variables, it's gonna add up to six. And so we have to figure out consistent with that rule that there are more R's than V's, how we can add up to six. Well, the most simple way to do this is to just start with one V. And I ask myself, all right, if I have just one in V, how many different ways can the other groups play out? Well, I could have two in R, which would leave three for the O booth. That adds up to six. Sticking with one in the V booth, we could have three in the R booth which would leave two in the O booth, which adds up to six. There's one more possibility when we have one in the V booth, that's four in the R booth. That leaves only one for the O booth, and remember we have to have at least one for each booth, so we can't go any farther with this. If we tried to put five in the R booth, that wouldn't work because the O booth would have nobody in it. Those are the three possibilities for when you have just one in the V booth. Now let's try two in the V booth. And here there's only one possibility. To get more in the R booth, we would have to have three, that's a minimum, and that leaves just one for the O booth, which once again adds up to six. There's nothing else we could do here. If we had two in the V booth and four in the R booth, that would be six. There would be nobody left over for the O booth and that would be a problem. So now we have some very valuable information. And the last thing we are going to do before we go to the questions is to make what we call scenarios. We're going to create four different setups matching each one of these things. And once we have done that, we're gonna have a roadmap to the game. Anything that is true about the game, anything that could work in the game has to work in one of those scenarios. In other words, if it doesn't work in any one of those scenarios, it doesn't work with the game. Once we've taken the time to do that, we're going to find that a lot of questions that would take us a long time are actually going to become fairly straightforward. And so this is what that would look like. I'm going to try, my first distribution was three, two, one. My next one was two, three, one. We had one, four, one. And then finally we have, I think, one, three, two. These are all of the possibilities. There is no other way for this to work out. 
And so once we've done this, consistent with the other rules that they gave us, G and M are always together, G and H never go in the O group, F and K never go in the V group, we can start filling things in. Well, in our first scenario, things are perfectly filled in. GM cannot go in the O booth because of these rules. And in our first three scenarios, actually, they can't go in the V booth either because there's not enough room for them, which means in these first three scenarios, we know where GM goes. There's nowhere to get it but into the R booth. There are just a few variables left in this first scenario. Well, they told us that H never goes in the O booth. The R booth is filled up, meaning in our first scenario, H has nowhere to go but the V booth. And then there's just nowhere else to go for F, K, and L but in that first booth. This is really helpful. And if we get to a question, I know at least one, uh, we'll get to a question that's referring to this scenario. We've already done the work that we need to do. And we've got, um, we've got it all down. For the rest of these three that we've already filled in, we've uh, filled in G and M. We know that F and K can never go in that remaining V slot, which means for the rest of these, the only thing that could go in this V slot is H or L. And then we just have F and K to get in, and then the other one of H or L somewhere. This last scenario, I think G and M can go in either the R booth or the V booth, and so it doesn't end up being very well filled in. However, um, you're going to find that a lot of times with scenarios, even if some scenarios are not totally filled in or are not terribly well filled in, they still narrow your focus while you're doing a question, and it will make it much easier for you to do that question. Um, so I know I went through this fairly quickly. We don't have a lot of time left, but I'm going to try to get through at least a few questions using this, these scenarios. So let me, um, I'm going to try to do something that's probably beyond my technical capabilities. I'm going to try to bring these scenarios down with us to the questions. And it looks like it may be working. Yeah. We can make it a little bit. All right. So these are our scenarios. Now let's take a look at, um, well, actually, let's take a look at the ones that, that really the scenarios are very helpful with. And if we have time after that, we can do another one or two. But there are a couple that the scenarios are very helpful with. So question number three says, if more employees are assigned to the organizer's booth than to the retailer's booth, which one of the following employees must be assigned to the visitor's booth? So they're saying, assume for the purposes of this question, here's what's going on. There are more organizers. Sorry, it's down here. There are more organizers than there are retailers. Well, if we look back at our scenarios and we say, okay, how can we do that? How can we get more organizers than retailers? Well, there's actually only one scenario that does that for us, and it's this one. Here we have three organizers and two retailers. In all of the other ones, there are less organizers than retailers. So we've already put in the work to answer this question. So when they say, who must be assigned to the visitor's booth in this situation? Well, who does it have to be? It's Hal. We took the time to do the work up front. And I see, I think Erica already answered our question, but that's the correct answer to this question. How? And we already did the work. So that's one question. Like I said, there's a couple of more that uh, require the scenarios or that make the scenarios, um, or the scenarios makes easier. So let me, once again, let me see if I can bring my scenarios down with me. my lasso select tool. Let's just bring these guys down here. Okay, here are my scenarios. I think question number five is another one that uses the scenarios. So question number five says, if Hal is assigned to a booth with exactly one other employee, 
then which one of the following could be true? So if I hadn't taken time to do these scenarios, I'd be asking myself, okay, how with just one other person, well, how many different ways can that work out? But now looking at my scenarios, there's actually only one place that we could get Hal together with just one other person. So if you look in our first scenario, Hal is by himself. So that scenario is not responsive. In our second scenario, um, Hal, and remember, they tell us up here that Hal can never be in the organizer's booth. So in the remaining scenarios, in this second scenario, Hal can't be with just one other person. He's going to be either in the V booth here by himself, or he might be with two other people in the R booth. Same thing down here. He might be by himself in the V booth, or he would be with three other people in the R booth. In other words, the only way that we can get Hal assigned to a booth with exactly one other employee is in this last scenario. And the only way that we could do that would be to put him in the visitor's booth with exactly one other employee. So we can fill this in and that would look like this. Hal goes into the visitor's booth. We don't know exactly who he's with. Well, actually we do know who he's with, but let's put in everybody else. We know we have G and M, they never go in the O slot. There's not enough room for them in V, so they have to be here. All we have left is F and K and L. One of the rules told us that F and K are never in the V slot which means the only guy who can go in the visitor slot with Hal is L. And then F and K are going to take up these two slots, but I'm not sure in what order. One will be in the organizer's booth, the other will be in the retailer's booth, but I don't know. Having done these scenarios, even though we had to end up filling it in, it made it much more easy for us to know what was the setup we were going to need to begin with. And so they say, which one of the following could be true? That means one answer choice here will work in this scenario and four answer choices will not work in this scenario. Um, answer choice A says, Laura is assigned to the organizer's booth. No, she's not, she's in the visitor's booth, so that's the wrong answer. B says, Frank is assigned to the retailer's booth. Um, that could be true, and that's the right answer, because it's possible that he's in the retailer's booth. He doesn't have to be, but that would work. All the rest of these do not work. Hal is in the retailer's booth. No, he's in the visitor's booth. Laura's in the retailer's booth. No, she's also in the visitor's booth. Gladys is in the visitor's booth. No, she's in the retailer's booth. So these scenarios helped us to quickly answer this question because we already knew what setup we needed to use. Um, unfortunately, we do not have time to go through the rest of these logic games questions, but these and other skills will um, appear in the LSAT Max course. And even though this stuff is very difficult to begin with, it's mathy or math-ish. And so you can often get to the point, most people, where you're knocking out many, many, many right answers. Um, but it takes a lot of practice. So that's the information that I have about the LSAT. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about LSAT Max, and then I will dive into that Q&A, which is up to, oh my gosh, 28 questions now. Oh, I see I ignored two participants with raised hands. I'm sorry, I will get to you in just a second. Um, so LSAT Max is an online course, and I think what sets us apart from the competition is something that has always been important with online study, but that is super important now, which is LSAT Max is a community. It's a community studying for the LSAT. Um, this month alone, or I guess it's next month because it's starting tomorrow, April, um, we have online office hours with one of our 99th percentile instructors every day, Monday through Sunday for the month of April. And what we really want, and the way this system works, is that we want to bring you into the LSAT Max family and for you to participate in a number of ways. And so let me just highlight a couple of these things. It starts out with this, instant lifetime access. So we give you the opportunity to study in the LSAT Max community at the pace that works for you. Um, you know, if you have work and kids or school or things like that, then, you know, six weeks in the program, you know, that charges you by the week or charges you monthly might not be enough. But we're not here to squeeze as much money out of you as possible. We're here to give you the tools that you need to get to test day. So 
most students, um, when you come in, you decide which LSAT you're taking and we will send you a schedule. And then the students who are in the LSAT max system that are uh, studying for that exam are on the same schedule. So they're working through the same materials. There are over a hundred hours of lesson videos. And as you work through the lesson videos, there's questions associated with it. There's um, real time message boards associated with all those questions, which allows you to go through the course about at the same time as other students and to be communicating with them as you are doing so. So there's those real time message boards, um, we also uh, have personalized live support. Like I was saying, the office hours that you get, and if you sign up for tutoring, that's with 99th percentile instructors. Um, uh, a couple of more things, depending upon the package you get, you get uh, access to all of the questions in the modern history of the LSAT. And so you simply cannot run out of practice with LSAT Max, which is important. You know, the LSAT, we generally give our, our study calendars are three or more months long. And I think for most people, because the LSAT is so new, you really do need to not just learn conceptually, you need to learn by practice. And so it's important to have all of this practice. That practice comes in a digital LSAT simulator. You don't want to learn what the format of the exam is on test day and LSAT Max gives you the format of the exam as you practice, which I think is super important. This, I think, is huge, especially toward the end of the course. Um, we are always tracking your performance by question type when it comes to logical reasoning, by game type, by uh, reading comp subject matter, and the students who end up seeing the most improvements, the students who see the improvements um, that they need, are the ones who really take the time to analyze their performance and think critically about how to make that performance better. Um, and those analytics are very, very helpful. So those are uh, kind of the basics of LSAT Max. But like I said, it is an LSAT studying community. Right now, I think we all need a little bit of community. So I hope that you will join us. Um, and having said all of that, I'm going to answer the raised hand questions now, and then I will jump into Q&A. And there are many Qs. I will try to provide some A's. All right, I think Catherine asked first. I'm going to let you fire away, Catherine. Catherine, you want to answer your question? No. Somebody else. Let me try now. Okay, Catherine, do you want to ask your question? I'm trying to unmute you, but it's not working. All right, I'm sorry. I keep clicking unmute, but it's not working. All right, so we're just going to have to jump on to the... You know, I apologize. Next time I will know how this works. I'm not entirely sure how it works, unfortunately. Um, so let me jump into the Q&A here. So let's start from the beginning. First question, do you suggest taking a cold diagnostic before starting any studying to get a baseline? Yes, I think it is a good idea to get um, a diagnostic for two reasons. One is to get a baseline, which I think is important. The other is to get an idea of what the subject matter of the exam is. Because once you get into the course, you're going to be going piece by piece through it. And it kind of, um, I think, helps to have a bird's eye view of what the exam looks like before you get there. So that's one of the things we offer. And you can uh, download the LSAT Max app for free and take, um, I believe, the, I think it's the July 2007 LSAT for free to get a baseline score. So I would strongly suggest that you do that. I think that's a good idea. Um, all right. How likely would you say it is for someone to be admitted to a law school with a low GPA, but they're aiming for an LSAT score in the 170s? All right. It depends on the school. So, um, well, let me say this. If you have a sub, 3.5 GPA, you will never get into Yale. You will probably never get into Harvard. You will probably never get into Stanford. And it doesn't matter what your LSAT score is. Um, 
that's tough news or tough love, but schools like that don't have to lower their numbers to get high LSAT numbers. And really that's uh, the difference. So um, more than a high GPA can make up for a low LSAT, it is the case that a low LSAT can make up, I mean, a high LSAT can make up for a low GPA, but really it all depends on how far away are you from their median GPA? That means you need to be probably about that far over their median LSAT to make up for. And so just the farther away you are on GPA, the more you have to beat the median on LSAT. It is possible at some schools, at the top schools, a low GPA is prohibitive, unfortunately. And I'm sorry, I wish that was not the case. All right, uh, Christopher asks, what sections in the LSAT typically give students the most difficulty? Well, I think it changes over the course of studying for the exam. Usually logic games give students the most trouble to begin with, but I think reading comprehension is probably the one that's hardest to improve upon. At the very least, I think it's the one where the timing is most difficult. And so I think that's the one that often ends up being the section that students struggle with, even though logic games is usually the one they start out struggling with. All right, I have serious studying Sally. All right, let me try to answer this question as seriously as possible. Is keeping the canceled score happening forever or just for this year's applications? I would imagine it will go away very soon. I don't know that they've given a time limit on it, but they're not going to do that forever. They're doing it now because people who needed a score don't have a score, and so they're trying to help people who just have no way to get any score. But I would almost guarantee they will stop doing it once this whole thing goes away and people start taking the exam again. So I would do it now. Um, all right, I, hear, I got an email. Those for March exam were automatically moved over to April. I have not heard of that. I would think the makers of the LSAT would do that. That's helpful information. If you did not get an email like that and you're wondering whether or not you missed the March exam, you should contact LSAC and make sure that they have changed the date for you. All right, uh, I have another question. I already have an MBA. How does that give me an advantage? Uh, uh, so, I think it gives you, so you can turn in your transcripts if you want from your MBA program and they can review your transcripts if they would like to. And if you did very well, then I think that might help them understand, you know, if there are some um, bad parts to your undergraduate GPA, something like that. I think that can be helpful for them. I think it's more helpful in kind of the holistic phase of the application process where they're looking at all the pieces of your application because what it shows is that you're going to come into law school with a base of knowledge that's very relevant. You know, a lot of the law is business law. And so if you have that understanding, those things go together very well. In fact, at UCLA where I was and at a lot of other schools, there are JD MBA programs where you do both a JD and an MBA and those five years are combined collapsed into four. Um, I think it's helpful. I don't know that it's a huge advantage over other students, but it depends upon the, the application package. If you think it's a great fact, then I think the best way to highlight it is for it to be wrapped into your personal statement. All right, next question. If your undergraduate GPA isn't very competitive for top law schools, such as UT Austin, say somewhere between 2.5 and 3.0, what other things can you do to become a competitive candidate and compensate for the low GPA, including scoring highly on the LSAT? So, um, well, let me say this. Law school admissions is kind of a two-step process where schools, at the very least competitive schools, will take a look at those two numbers, your LSAT and your GPA, and they will decide whether or not they want to report those numbers, whether or not they want those numbers to come out of their school. because that's how, or a big part of how they get their rankings in the US News and World Report and other rankings agencies, which is what is their median GPA. There are some schools, like I said, the competitive schools that just aren't going to listen. They don't want their numbers brought down by GPA and nothing you can offer them on LSAT is going to change that. The only thing in that first step of the application process that can change that calculus is a high LSAT score. 
that is, I think, the most important, it's the most important part of your application package, no matter what. But especially if you're trying to compensate for a low GPA, that's important. Everything else is holistic. And so without having seen, you know, knowing about you or your, you, what schools you're applying to or what, you know, your history was, what I can say is that, um, you know, you should just turn in the best application package possible, which is a stellar personal statement is very important. Good letters of recommendation from your professors are very important. Um, but that's about as much as I can tell you. And LSAT is unfortunately the most important. All right, I have Michael asking a question. What are we doing on time here? 112, we still got some time. Took my first LSAT cold and scored high enough to have been accepted, but retested to increase scholarship offers. Studied hard and made sure I answered all the questions, even if I wasn't sure of them, but scored worse than before. Was it a mistake to answer all questions on a section, especially the ones I didn't know? No, there is no guessing penalty on the LSAT. You should never, never, never leave a question blank. Um, I always tell my students, especially if you run out of time, to um, answer all the same letter because you're likely to get about one out of five of every questions you answer. But no, do not leave questions blank. That is a mistake. Jeremy asks, how is the writing sample administered at home? Is it through a ProctorU type of platform? I believe, I don't know, I'm not familiar with ProctorU, but it's probably like what I had in law school, which is you will be locked out of your other programs by a program that they force you to download and take the test on. And they, I believe, also make you have your webcam on so they can make sure that you're not cheating. Um, but that's my understanding of how it works. And I think you get just 35 minutes anyway. Anonymous asks, would you recommend taking the LSAT at least twice or just once or multiple times? Um, I don't know that I would recommend taking it at least twice, but what I would say is that I think most people take it twice. I took it twice before I got the score that I wanted to, and I think it's perfectly fine to take it twice. I think taking it three times starts to look like maybe you um, are having trouble determining what your weaknesses are and accounting for them. So I think taking it a whole bunch of times could be a problem, but you should aim for the score that you wanna get, and once you get that score, that should be all the times you take the LSAT. If that's once, if that's twice, hopefully. All right, Christopher asks, how helpful is it for one's law school application to have legal work experience, work at a law firm after undergrad? I would say it's slightly helpful. The reason I only say slightly is the same reason that the LSAT is not a test of your understanding of legal knowledge, which is, Law schools assume that you're going to come in knowing nothing about the law. And they assume that they're going to take you from knowing nothing to being a lawyer in three years. And so while I think it's um, helpful to have relevant experience, and I think it can be a positive thing if they're down to between you and one other student and they're trying to determine who to admit, then I think having that relevant um, experience is helpful, but it is not necessary. Thomas asks, do I have to renew my LSAT score after a number of years? Most schools will accept LSAT scores that are five years or younger if you have a score that's five years or older. Uh, actually, younger than five years. I think at five years, you probably need to take it again. Anonymous asks, what to do when you finish a section, take the homework, and get a bad score? How do you prefer to review? Um, that's a very long conversation and I don't know that I have time to answer all of it, but let me just give you uh, what I think is the important thing to do, which is your review should, for each question that you get wrong, you should answer these three questions. Why was my answer wrong? Why was the right answer right? And most importantly, how could I have anticipated the correct answer? Now with different question types and on different section types, the way to anticipate the correct answer is different. But that's where I think mastery comes from, is when you have an idea of what the answer choice ought to look like before you get to the answers. And that's the best way to review. What was the structural thing? Because the makers of the LSAT are very good at hiding this, but they do the same things over and over again. 
And so seeing past subject matter to structure is what's really important. And once you see that the same structures appear over and over again, that's when you're understanding, oh, I didn't anticipate because I didn't identify this structure, this common structure that happens over and over again. Um, one of the office hours that I did recently was specifically on reviewing past practice exams. So if you join up with LSAT Max, you'll be able to watch that video, which I think is very valuable, personally. All right, what are we doing? I think I've got until like 1.30. So hopefully we can get through, ooh, that's a lot of questions and they keep coming. I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but let's keep going. Um, Jacob says, does the uh, LSAC provide resources and materials for students to get used to the new electronic format of the LSAT? If not, where can students get practice using the tablet, silence, and scratch paper? Uh, you can't get practice, I don't think, using the tablet, but you can go to their website and use the interface. They've got it mocked up for you there and you can see what it looks like. Um, so that's helpful-ish. I know that they were doing practice exams, at least a few out there where they were handing out the stylus and allowing you to use it, but obviously now that everybody is stuck indoors, um, they're not doing that anymore. So that's the best I can tell you, go to their website. But if you sign up for Test Max, you get um, an interface that's identical. Let's see. Uh, Leslie asks, I want to go to Southwestern Law School. Is it a good school, would you say? Um, I actually have spent a lot of time at Southwestern Law School and I do think it's a good school. Uh, what worries me about Southwestern, and I haven't seen the numbers in a couple of years, but in the very recent past, their employment numbers were very low, meaning that students who graduated from Southwestern were having trouble. I think the metric that they give is nine months after law school, the percentage of students who have secured a, a JD required job, and it was low. I don't think that means it's a bad school. The problem with it is that Southwestern is graduating students into a job market where students from UCLA, USC, Pepperdine, and Loyola, which are all large law schools that are much higher ranked, are also graduating classes into that market every year. And so it's not a bad law school, but it is hard to get a job out of it. And obviously, getting a job is important. Anonymous asks, those of us who are just starting to study, should we take a practice LSAT? I think I answered this before, and the answer is yes. Please take a practice LSAT. There is a free one available just by downloading the LSAT Max app for free. Caroline asks, what is the timeline for the test? If I want to go to law school in fall 2022, when should I take the LSAT? Um, most law schools begin accepting applications in October, the year before you would be accepted. So if you wanna to go to law school in fall 2022, you would start applying in October 2021, which means any LSAT that you took before then, you would be right on time. I think as long as you're getting in your application kind of before the end of the year, most law schools do rolling admissions, so they start giving away seats early, um, but they still save a lot of seats. Some schools cut off their application periods in February. Some keep going until like June of the same year that you would attend law school. And so you should determine by looking at the websites of the schools that you're interested in, you should determine um, when you have to apply by. But anything before October 2021 LSAT should be fine. Thomas asks, what is an addendum? In addition to your personal statement, um, sometimes, well, so a lot of law schools will ask you to disclose stuff you don't want to disclose. Or you might have a bad GPA and you want to explain it. Basically, an addendum is an extra essay that you write, usually to explain something bad. The advice that I would give on an addendum if you're going to write it is if you're explaining something bad, what you have to show is that there is a good explanation for it and that it's something that will not continue into the future. So, you know, for instance, if you, I don't know, got bad grades because you drink heavily and you continue to drink heavily, then don't write an addendum about it because there's no reason to believe that the problem has gone away. 
But that's the basic idea. It explains away a bad fact about your um, application. And so you write it for that reason. Anonymous attendee asks, how long do you suggest studying before taking the exam? It depends upon how much time, what, what your bandwidth is to, to approach the test. So if you have, you know, if you're gonna take the summer off to study, you have no job, it's reasonable to believe that in two months, you can be prepared. Um, that's, I think, a compressed schedule. Two months studying for the LSAT is not that much. If you have a lot of responsibilities and you can only, you know, study for an hour, you know, two or three nights a week, then it may be many more months than that. Um, I really think for most people, unless you come into the LSAT already knowing these concepts and being good at them, you should carve out three months, probably more. Um, anonymous attendee asks, in the logic game question we did, what should you do? Is there an easy way to solve if you do not have the shared term in the middle? I'm assuming you're talking about the logical reasoning question. I'm always hesitant to answer hypothetical questions because they, they if you're asking what would happen if the stimulus were differently phrased, then you couldn't diagram it. So I'm not sure I can really answer that question. Thomas asks, should I pick a major that stands out or one that I'm guaranteed a good grade? Uh, that's kind of a tough question because I don't think there is a good law major. I think you can major in anything. That said, you know, if you're doing like independent studies and all of your grades are pass fail or something like that, that doesn't necessarily look as good as if you're doing a, um, a more difficult major. So, I would probably do the one that you think is going to dovetail best with whatever it is you want to do in law school. For instance, if you're going to be a patent lawyer, then you would have an engineering degree. If you want to be a business lawyer, then you might do a business degree or something like that. That would be my recommendation. All right, a few more. Faith asks, I'm taking the LSAT in June and July. If I do good on the July one, will most law schools have distributed their financial aid scholarships or will I have a chance to get scholarships? Or are other good places to get scholarships for law school? Well, if I'm reading you right, June and July are both very early. As long as you're not applying for this year, you're applying for next year. So if you're applying for 2021, rather than applying for 2020, then the scholarships will all be available at that point because they won't have even started accepting students until October. So I don't think you should worry about it. Kendra asked, wouldn't this take a long time on the test? I'm guessing that was the stuff that we went through with logic games. And what I would say to that is that if you don't practice it enough, it will take a long time on the test. But if you get enough practice with it, then you're an expert and it shouldn't take very long. And a lot of your practice, especially toward the end of the course, should be timed practice. The last thing I'll say is that it is very often the case on the LSAT, and this is true on all of the sections of the exam, that the time you put in on the front end pays off on the back end. It's entirely possible with that game we did, if you spent just two minutes on the setup, then one question might take you five or six minutes. But if you spend five or six minutes on the setup, each of the questions you might be able to blow through in 30 seconds. Um, <clears throat> Giovanni asks, what should letters of recommendation from professors, TAs, address about the applicant? Here's how I think the most effective letters of recommendation work, which is that they're supporting documentation to the argument that you're making in your personal statement. And so what I would do is I would take, I would write my personal statement and I would take it to my professor and say, look, this is the case that I'm making for why I'm a good candidate for these law schools. Can you just write what you know about me can you give them the facts that would show that this argument I am making is true? That's my best recommendation. Everybody's personal statement is going to be different, but if your letters back it up, I think that's the most helpful. Giovanni also asked, what are the recommendations to deciding on how to base what schools you should apply to? I think the most important things you should consider are what do you want to do after law school and where do you want to do it? 
So if you want to practice a particular type of law in a small market, then hopefully you can find a school in that market that teaches that kind of law um, or that focuses on that kind of law. But each law school has its own, you know, like uh, journals and um, different uh, legal clinics and extracurricular groups and things like that. And so I think it should be something where you're having the best possible plan that you can for what your life after school looks like. And then the school that you go to is going to help you get there. If you want to go right out of law school and be an entry level associate at one of the big firms like a Jones Day or Irel Manella or Morrison and Forrester, then you really have to go to a top 20 law school. But otherwise, pick one and also one that you should also look at their job placement rate and their bar passage rate. Those things are important. Just a few more questions. At what point in the scholastic year do you apply to law schools? Uh, like I was saying earlier, application season opens in October for matriculation the next year. So in October of this year, you'll be able to apply for, for matriculation in fall of 2021. Most schools go through February. Um, check to see if your other schools, uh, if the schools you want to do that. I see what recommendation or tips do you have for somebody interested in JAG? Are any law schools particularly good for this program? Does this bolster your application? Wow, I don't actually have a good answer for that. So JAG is Judge Advocate General. I don't know if you guys have seen the show. These are military lawyers. I mean, I think you can come from just about any law school and be a JAG. I wish I had a better answer for you. I don't. Bryce asks, where could you look if you wish to do an in-person LSAT prep course? Well, we don't offer those, and um, I'm not sure that many places are offering them right now as well. Fortunately, I can't help you seek out our competitors, but I do wish you the best of luck. Alexa asks, do you have to be pre-law to do well on the LSAT or in law school? Actually, pre-law does nothing for the LSAT. Do you want to know what the major for the LSAT is? Philosophy. That's the LSAT major. Um, and take all of the symbolic logic courses that you can get, like critical thinking, logic. Those are the ones that are going to prepare you for the LSAT. I think pre-law will help prepare you for law school. But again, like I was saying, law schools don't expect you to be prepared um, in terms of learning the law before you get there. So I would worry mostly about just having the kind of experience in school that you're going to do well in your classes, uh, have extracurricular activities that you can put on your resume and talk about in your personal statement. Um, but I don't think you have to do pre-law to go to law school. All right, I think I've got time for one more. Um, under the COVID-19 circumstances with so many folks furloughed these days, are there any financial discounts being offered? Um, I am not sure what the discounts are that we are offering. You will receive an email at the end of this with, I believe, um, some offers. And I think, I think there will be offers off the course. I'm not, I didn't coordinate with our um, director of marketing before this. So I'm not entirely sure what are the, um, what are the discounts, but I believe there are, there are some discounts. And if you are able to secure a fee waiver from LSAC, you can take the LSAT Max course for free. You just, they will send you a PDF saying you have been accepted for the fee waiver and um, we will give you lifetime access as well. So we're at about 1.30. I'm sorry, I was not able to answer all of your questions. I see there are a lot more, but um, I appreciate you guys tuning in. Hopefully this was helpful for you. Like I said, um, come join the LSAT Max community. We are online all the time, 24 hours a day. There are going to be office hours repeatedly in the very near future. Let's all get th through this together. All right, um, like I said, thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys listening. Best of luck with your LSAT study and hopefully I will see you guys in office hours very soon. Take care.